Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my work with soft biointegrated devices for advanced medical applications, which is uh, primarily, I would say, work I did during my PhD over at the University of Illinois in Northwestern. Uh, and it's focused on asking uh, about Moore's Law uh, and what we can do to bring core aspects of Moore's Law uh, to bear on, on biological problems. So Moore's Law, for folks who uh, have, uh, don't follow it, is this non-scientific statement by the first uh, the founder of Intel, the late 50s, who said that the number of transistors on a, on a silicon chip would double each year. Uh, it's not a law that anyone expected would be followed in any meaningful way, but remarkably, over the past 50 years, it's held true. Uh, largely because of incredible accompanying advances in physics, chemistry, optics, material science, uh, and so on. And those, those types of advances have actually allowed the types of information processing that we take for granted today, whether it's uh, small smartphones that have incredible computing power or broad you know, connectivity. And as we start to build these devices that can communicate uh, and process information at incredible speeds and with, uh, with high bandwidth uh, and with high clock speeds, it's, it's worth asking whether it, that, that would be useful in a biological context and whether we can combine these electronic systems and biology in a meaningful way. And the key word really is meaningful because there's plenty of uh, approaches that uh, where you could simply take a device and sort of uh, loosely interface it with skin, uh, perhaps not quite as trivially as in the photo here, but uh, even if you consider things like Fitbit and Apple Watches, which have gotten extremely sophisticated, uh, you know, some of them are even FDA cleared, uh, it's really asking, can we go, you know, even several steps beyond that. Broadly, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you about how you might do it from a materials and mechanics standpoint, but also some examples of where it might be useful uh, from a translational standpoint. So as a foundational building block concept, uh, I want to talk a bit about conformal contact. Most existing devices that you might find, uh, like a Fitbit or a smartwatch, look like that top left cartoon. You have your skin, which is textured on a, a, and, and sort of micro-textured, and you have your device that's just kind of sitting on it. You know, what that means is you're gonna have motion artifacts, low quality contact, all kinds of noise, uh, and it'll probably move when the person moves, which is not great. What you really want is something that looks more like the bottom left cartoon, um, where this, the devices are really conformal to the, to the textures and the grooves of the surface of skin, or indeed, you know, any biological tissue. And I'm gonna distill a lot of really great work by a lot of uh, theoreticians and, and mechanicians and simply say that there are certain engineering knobs that you can turn to accomplish this. Uh, most prominently, the bending stiffness, which is a product between the Young's modulus, which is the stretchability of a material, it's a material's property, and the second area moment, which is given by I, uh, and that's a geometrical property. It scales most dramatically with the thickness of the device, and you can also tune the surface energy. So long story short, you can make the devices sufficiently uh, soft and, and, and thin, and tune the surface energy to actually accomplish the kind of conformal contact that, that you might be interested in this context. The second thing is, you know, skin is not, uh, skin's a stretchable material. It has a certain amount of elasticity to it uh, before it tears. And so if you have a device that's not quite matched in terms of those properties, then you can have things like tearing and delamination. So uh, how do you actually account for high quality device elements that can both bend and stretch like skin does? So there's a couple of tricks you can use here as well. The first is a trick in mechanics. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a sheet of any material and you bend it, like you can imagine bending an eraser, the top plane of that eraser is gonna be under tensile stress, the bottom is gonna be under compressive stress, but there exists a plane somewhere in the middle of that stack that's under neither. And so if you think about taking a, and that's called a neutral mechanical plane. So if you think about taking a high quality device element like a metal or a semiconductor, uh, encapsulating it top and bottom with a, with a stiff plastic that has a lot of, that, that absorbs most of these mechanical stresses. You can actually place the device in the neutral mechanical plane in a way that largely uh, mitigates the effects of these stresses. So that's how you make it flexible and still functional, but you also need to make it stretchable. Uh, and the way you might do that is, is pretty intuitive, actually. You, you essentially use traditional tricks you might find in an academic uh, clean room, like photolithography, and simply pattern uh, thin film metallic traces or semiconducting traces in these wavy serpentine formats. And in that way, and then you can mount it on a stretchable elastomer, for example. So that way you essentially take stiff materials and impart to them the properties of a rubber band. Um, and so that's how you do it. You make it thin, you make it wavy. And the results, the results suggest that you can actually stretch these things fairly well. If you take a you know, good old piezoresistive sensor, something that changes its resistance to a change in a material's property, uh, as a very standard workhorse sensor, you can actually 
um, mount this on skin, uh, have, have it stretch uh, under tension and shear, and you can actually get fairly good device performance uh, all the way up to and in some cases beyond the point where skin actually tears. Um, you also want these things to be reusable, right? So you want to be able to take it off, put it back on. And so things like fatigue loading become important, which is how the material performs under repeat loadings. Uh, and it turns out that if you're about under 16% strain or less, which is around where skin tears, you can actually deform this thing up to 10,000 cycles without, without really seeing the adverse effects of that. So, you know, these set of tools are pretty enabling in this context. Now, everything I've talked about so far is use a simple metallic resistive element as an example, which is a good workhorse. But if you really want to go beyond that, it's a good idea to think about semiconductors because those are the fundamental building blocks of logic gates and uh, multiplexed addressing, and, and you can really do much more advanced things with semiconductors. And silicon is the workhorse of that. So similar set of tricks apply. You can take uh, a thin film silicon uh, material. You can do all the things you might do to make a semiconductor or a computing element with it, like doping and transfer printing, uh, completely encapsulated hermetically with a stiff polymer, like I talked about, and you actually get high quality device elements. So that's a PN junction diode. Um, and you can transfer print these onto arbitrarily curved surfaces by uh, rubber stamping it exactly like you might rubber stamp some ink uh, from an inkwell. Um, semiconductors are pretty brittle. So that means that when you have, uh, when you stretch it or bend it too much, they can crack. And when things crack, you form defects and that can be pretty catastrophic for the device performance. So it's worth, worth asking the question, how do these things actually perform when you, when you load them in these ways? So I took a you know, silicon diode, loaded it onto a thin elastomer sheet, in this case, PDMS, stretched it, curled it. Uh, and, and long story short, you can actually do all kinds of stretching and curling with it without fundamentally eroding the device properties or getting micro cracks. Uh, in it. So, and, and in this case, it actually acts as a pretty good temperature sensor too. And this is work that, you know, a lot of folks have been doing now for almost the last 10 years. So it's, it's a really, and have been able to build some advanced devices on. So it's a good enabling set of concepts. So how is any of this useful, right? Um, in, in the short answer is in many ways, there's, there's people have done it in all kinds of application spaces, but uh, my training was as a mechanical engineer. So I, I really like thermal transport and there's very few uh, thermal transport systems as incredible as the human body. There's so many thermal stresses and shocks that we interact with on a daily basis, but we still manage to keep our temperature within a fairly narrow range. And as an example of that, there's a couple of infrared images of somebody's legs before they cycle and before they get into a sauna. And that's what they're, it looks like after, uh, after they do those things. So in both cases, there's a the thermal stress to the system. And there's this incredible, dramatic, short-term modulation of vascular activity going on beneath the surface of the skin to modulate that, in addition to the stuff that you actually can't see with your own eyes, with like sweating. Uh, so being able to track that turn ends up being pretty important in a range of contexts. So, you know, there's two ways, you, two things you can do. You can do skin-mounted devices, but also implantable devices. So simple, simplest examples are probably skin-mounted devices, and we can start with a humble temperature sensor. Uh, it's really a good building block for advanced kind of thermal measurements. Uh, the optical, uh, so it's, it's a simple thin film resistor. It's, it's really not very fancy. Uh, and when you have a thin film resistor of a high quality metal, in this case gold, uh, that if you change the temperature, the resistance of that material changes in response to that temperature in a fairly linear, predictable, controllable way. So you have a very high quality temperature sensor. Uh, and you can render, that, render this temperature sensor onto these soft, stretchable elastomer sheets and you end up with uh, temperature resolution and a response time that are better than uh, what a clinical gold standard would do and as faster than anything the body can do respectively. And that's pretty well validated at this point with clinical gold standard infrared imaging. So that's, so that's cool. Uh, temperature is good. It's, a good. it's a good first step. But things get much more exciting when you go beyond passive temperature measurements because it turns out that the body has thermal transport properties. And mapping those thermal transport properties is really useful as a, as a window into several other physiological processes. Um, so there's a slightly non-intuitive concept here. If you, the, the sensor itself is a simple resistor, right? Um, if you run a certain amount of current through that resistor, you create heating. And, for, and that heating squares with the, scales with the square of the current. So it's I squared times resistance. Um, and, it is, and, and so the non-intuitive thing is it is simultaneously acting as a temperature sensor and as a heater. So it's sensing its own temperature while it's heating. And the simple way to think about what that looks like is if you dangle that device in air, which is a good insulator, it's heating. That heat doesn't have anywhere to go because it's in an insulating environment. So it's get, it gets pretty hot. But if you put it on a good conductive material like diamond, let's say, it gets dissipated away very effectively and it doesn't get very hot. 
the human body is somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. So uh, you have biological tissue with these thermotransport properties. And so if you're able to simultaneously make heat, uh, very low quality, imperceptible heating and make temperature measurements, you can make very precise uh, thermal metrology type instruments out of this. So you have uh, a heating sensing element, you, you titrate a certain controlled amount of power into that skin. You have a local temperature rise that's governed with this, you know, this analytical form that you can curve fit to where you have parameters such as your power that you control, a non-dimensionalized scaling factor, which is just captures the basic physics of the system and that your thermal transport property. So what you can do then is get experimental data, fit it to this functional form and get uh, thermal transport properties that you can map out with fairly good precision if you, if you calibrate it appropriately. Um, there's several applications for this. The most straightforward one was moisture sensing. So your skin has a lot of trapped water content in its outer layers and the amount of trapped water content profoundly affects these thermal transport properties. So if you use one of these elements, in this case, there's, here's a couple of infrared images of the small hotspot uh, on a sample of pig skin, which is a good model for human skin for these purposes. Uh, you can actually have different levels of hydration of this pig skin, uh, this porcine skin, and you get very characteristic temperature curves. And you can then do that across a full range of physiologically relevant uh, hydration levels. And you get a fairly linear uh, correlation that you can model with a simple rule of mixture. So what you end up with is a fairly straightforward moisture sensor in this context. And uh, this caught the attention of a cosmetics company, L'Oreal. They said, you know, we, we deal with, you know, moisturizers and lotions and so on. So it'd be interesting to you to, to build some of this tech out. Um, but one of the key sort of drawbacks was wires, right? If you really want to translate this in any meaningful way, having a wired apparatus is uh, quite a limiting factor there because it doesn't really allow anyone to move around. It defeats the purpose. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. Our first study with L'Oreal, 20 volunteers, they had to sit perfectly still because they had three briefcases full of electronics because there's a sensor and all the other stuff that surrounds it that supports it uh, took a lot of space. So, you know, uh, making it fully wireless miniaturized is a really important piece of this. And it's not easy, it turns out, because there's several options, several drawbacks. Uh, but one option that looked actually pretty interesting, particularly for a sort of consumer physiological biomarker mapping uh, type of application, was near-field communication. Uh, which is uh, basically inductive coupling between uh, an antenna and what's on your device at very, very short ranges. Uh, and folks probably have speakers that run on NFC in their homes. Um, and it's attractive for a few reasons, but primarily it's because you can basically do data readout and you can power the device simultaneously. So you eliminate the need for a battery, which is really cool. Uh, but also most people have smartphones these days that have inbuilt NFC architecture. So you can basically use the existing supercomputer that we you carry around in your pocket anyway to interface with the device. Um, but integrating it is a, is a mechanics problem because you need high quality components, antennae, uh, you know, signal processing electronics to be able to actually support a system like this, but you also can't sacrifice the advantages of a soft thin device. So spent a lot of time thinking about how you could take a board that could do this, a flexible circuit board, integrated with a soft stretchable sensor uh, to yield an integrated device that's useful. And in this, in this case, it's, it's useful to think about the bending stiffness again. It scales with the cube of the thickness, which is H. Um, and if you take a circuit board, it takes stiff materials, a few, few tens of microns, and you have a bending stiffness in about 10 to the negative six range, which is about as much as aluminum foil. Um, but if you actually take the sensor part, you have stiff materials, but in nanofilms or, or a, a single digit microns. And then you have something that's five orders of magnitude more compliant. And when you integrate the two, you have a flexible board with a really soft stretchable sensor. And that gives you interesting opportunities in uh, combining the advantages of a high quality circuit board for signal processing with a uh, thin film circuit. And that actually allows for some cool opportunities like letting someone wear this device for a week covered with a single layer of Tegaderm uh, and let them just wear it for a week, uh, shower, exercise, sleep, what have you, and make continuous high quality measurements throughout. So that, that, was, a, that was a fun application of that. Things get even more exciting, however, when you think about uh, directional thermal transport measurements. So, so far we've taken these heating elements and just seen how heat dissipates through the skin and made measurements that way. Uh, and that's how it works, right? So if you do this and you do an infrared image, you see concentric circles if you view it from top because that heat's going equally in every direction. The picture looks a bit different when you have flow. So we have a lot of biological flow, blood vessels, what have you. Now suppose you have that flow going beneath the surface of the skin. It turns out that the thermal transport profile looks pretty different. It looks a lot more directional along the direction of the flow. Uh, and so your infrared image looks a lot more dramatically biased like that. And then the job becomes pretty simple, right? You place a temperature sensor downstream, a temperature sensor upstream, 
to be able to track this anisotropic flow, right? It's anisotropic in the sense it's directional along, along where the flow is going. Um, and when you do that, you can actually use these temperature measurements to quantitatively correlate back to a flow magnitude. So what you have in, uh, in effect is a non-invasive flow sensor. Uh, and you can slap it on your skin and it can actually track what's going on with, with vessels and so on underneath your skin. Um, and to really build out the capabilities of this tech, uh, you know, we, we put together a simple, uh, a large dense array sort of device where you have a centralized thermal actuator, which is a heater, and surrounded with, with a dense array of about 100 little temperature sensors, each of which is individually addressable. And you can create, with some signal process, and you can create a thermal map that looks very much like what an infrared camera might provide you. So that was really interesting. And we spent a lot of time playing around with blood vessels and, and how you might map flow through them quantitatively. This caught the attention of neurosurgeons at Northwestern who said they deal with this problem called hydrocephalus all the time, and they wanted to work with us. So for context, hydrocephalus is fluid buildup in the brain. Sometimes the ventricles of your brain don't absorb enough of your uh, cerebrospinal fluid, your CSF, uh, or drains too slowly, uh, or they, it produces too much, with the effect that you have a buildup and an increase in uh, intracranial pressure, your ICP. Now, it's uh, it can be fatal if it's untreated. It affects uh, over a million people in the United States. It's a lot more common than, than folks realize. Um, and it's almost always treated with the surgical implantation of a tube uh, called a shunt. A surgeon will place the shunt into the brain. Uh, it runs underneath your skin and drains into your abdomen uh, area usually. And shunts are great. They work super well. They save lives until they don't, uh, in the sense that they have extremely high failure rates. They can fail uh, close to 100% of the time across 10 years, and they primarily affect kids, uh, shunt failure does. And when they fail, the symptoms are very nonspecific, headaches, nausea, that kind of thing, until it gets really, really dangerous and the person is fighting for their life. So uh, out of an abundance of caution, people have to subject these patients to a ton of tests, sometimes exploratory surgery. So it's not uncommon to see people who are in their teens or early 20s who've had a shunt their whole life with almost 200 surgeries or hundreds of CT scans. So you can think, and, and it's just a huge disruption to daily life. So you're missing birthdays and, and travel and, and all kinds of things. So it's a hugely disruptive thing. So these surgeons came to us and says, said, look, you have a flow sensor. Would it be possible to take this flow sensor, have a patient wear this on their skin over the shunt and actually measure flow through it to tell us what's going on with the shunt that can obviate the need for some of these other measures. So we thought about that problem and it turns out that it actually is very well suited to that application. So we spent a lot of time developing the tech out in the lab, but then did an IRB approved study at Northwestern with some close collaborators led by Dr. Uh, Amit Ayer, uh, seen in the picture here. And in places, cases where we had uh, confirmed flow, we placed the device on the shunt and as a control immediately adjacent off the shunt and actually found a uh, pretty significant difference between the two, which is expected because if you have flow confirmed on the shunt, you should see uh, this thermal anisotropy. So that's been a really interesting project because it's uh, allowed us to then really build the tech out because there's a clear need over here. We've uh, then gone and made the device completely wireless. It has a small onboard battery and a Bluetooth radio. It communicates and reads out flow in real time on a smartphone. Um, and we've done it on over 25 patients to date in IRB approved studies, both adults and pediatrics. Uh, and then Dr. Iyer and myself also co-founded a company to translate this uh, and got a breakthrough designation from the FDA earlier this year. And it's pretty, pretty well on track now to get uh, cleared with the de novo next year. So that's, that was all the sort of things you can do with a, with a wearable device. But I, I want to sort of conclude really quickly by talking about what I think is a really exciting space moving forward, which is soft electronics are best suited to go where hard rigid electronics can't go. So you can, prop, you can look at the literature today and find several amazing examples of interfaces to the brain, the heart, several other organs. Um, and one of the things that I think is really cool for an implanted device is, a, is, is an interface to the peripheral nervous system, both in the context of neuromodulation and pain management, which is, of course, a really, really big problem, particularly in the United States these days uh, with, with the opioid crisis and so on. So thinking about implantable device, the peripheral nervous system, um, I, I, I thought the most obvious expansion of the platform for the wearable device was a blood flow sensor because the nerve blood flow has a strong correlate to uh, loss of functions in patients with diabetes. So that's one of the devices wrapped around the sciatic nerve of a rat. It measures blood flow through implanted vessels uh, and it's mounted on a silicone, a PDMS membrane that wraps around the nerve in a cuff format. Um, and this is, a, this is interesting because 
this, the same processing approaches that made this can actually make a full library of uh, device elements. So you can think about temperature sensors and recording electrodes, uh, optoelectronic elements uh, like LEDs, if, you want, if you're interested in doing peripheral nerve optogenetics and those kinds of applications um, and so on. So that's kind of the, the story of what we've been able to do with these soft devices, both on, on skin mounted applications for diagnostics and now uh, in, in implantable applications. So several thank yous to give uh, both folks uh, at, at MIT and folks I worked with at Northwestern and Illinois. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, please post them in the in the group chat and I'll, I'll read them out. Um, but I'm just going to start off. Um, so I was just interested by, I, I mean, I think the flow sensing is fantastic. Um, uh, I was just wondering what, what sort of depth of resolution you have. Is, is, is you only looking at flows which are very close to the surface or can you get any distinction between say um, flow at the surface and a bit further into the tissue? Yeah, it's a really good question get, that gets to the core of a lot of this stuff. We've maxed out our depth at about six millimeters below the surface of the skin. Uh, and six millimeters covers most, uh, many if not most major veins, BP shunts, um, microcapillary flow uh, through the surface, but it's probably insufficient to get to arteries. So that's where we are. And um, do you see any sort of confounding effects then? If you have the, if you're, if you're measuring the flow through one of these artificial shunts, do you have um, confounding effects by blood flow? Yeah. So as, uh, so we did a sort of series of experiments where we simulated the effects of uh, an artery not too not too far away near surface veins and not too far away both in co-flow and counterflow configurations uh, and it turns out that you know with most physiologically relevant spacings between what you might find in a shunt and these vessels uh, it's it's like less than a five percent error okay okay and then um, I, I think you with the with the XY resolution um, I, I think you showed your array yeah. Um, is, is that your, your limit or can you, can you go at sort of much closer, um, electrode spacings or are you yeah. sort of physically constrained with your electronics there? Yeah. So that's an interesting question. So there's a couple of ways in which you can do that. Um, you can certainly get closer. Uh, I, I you know, the, the sort of driving engineering principle here was your, the, res the sensitivity of your sensors goes up with the base resistance. So you want to give this thing as many coils as you can to make it as sensitive as mm -hmm. possible. Uh, there's no reason you couldn't go smaller, and, and we have. But I think the really cool way to sort of scale this in a much more uh, vast kind of way is using these types of semiconducting arrays, because diodes are really good temperature sensors too. They have a much smaller footprint. Uh, and this, what you're looking at right now, is in fact a dense temperature sensing array, very much like the other one, except it's using diodes as the sensors and not resistors. So and then, you can, then you're limited only by you know, your academic clean room. You can, you can do the same approaches you might use to have like a backplane display on an, on an LED TV. So they're really tightly packed. Okay, sure, sure, that's interesting. Um, and then I was just curious with the, um, again, with the flow through the, 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 the shunts. Um, if, you're, if you're implanting these, these shunts, um, can you just attach the sensors to the shunts like during the implantation process? And get a direct measurement rather than having the the sensor sort of outside the body. Yeah, you you absolutely can, and I think there's some folks thinking about doing inline temperature sensing uh, or implantable temperature sensing or, or flow sensing in this in this way. The problem with I, I, you certainly could. Uh, I, I think the the problem is sort of more of one of practicality. Uh, shunts fail a lot. Implantable sensors fail a lot. And, you know, when you have like a faulty reading, you're almost confounding those two failure modes. So it sometimes can obfuscate more than it clarifies. That's the issue there. But there's no materials reason you couldn't do it. Okay. And is, is, is this sort of, can these, can these systems be integrated uh, in vivo sort of with, with maybe more biological systems? So as a, as a sort of cardiac patch, for example, or other, other tissues, has that been explored? Absolutely, yeah. So I think there's a really famous example. It actually came out of the group I did my PhD from, but before I was there, from 2014, where there was a really cool device with that, that was sort of 3D printed to a cardiac mold, and I, I think they called it a heart sock. So it's, it's like a sock you can put a heart into, uh, and it wraps very conformally. 
Okay. Also, okay. You can do mapping ablation. Yeah. And I guess the, the, the stretchability there is a major advantage. Um, so we, we've got a few late questions coming in. So there's um, one from Jeff here. So it's a fantastic project. Well done. Um, and he, he, he may have missed it, but uh, can you um, give us information about what the response time is like? Oh, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so response time goes up with, uh, with the skin thickness. So for a relatively, so if you're just doing passive temperature sensing, the response time is less than 20 milliseconds because the thermal mass of the device is extremely low because they're very, very thin. But when you're doing flow, something, you have another factor, which is you heat it up, that heat has to diffuse through skin, get to the shunt, and then diffuse back up to your temperature sensor. So that, that can be a bottleneck. So there you look at a characteristic response time for most physiological shunts of like 25 to 30 seconds. Is that a limitation or is that sufficient for, for most it's, things you need to do? Yeah, it's sufficient in the sense that most flow related modulations happen on the order of, uh, both for veins and for shunts, happen on the order of like minutes. Uh, so it's, it's like better than that. So you can track most important changes. Okay. okay. We've, I think we've got time for one more question. So this is from Pranav, um, who asks, are the, are the materials used, are they biocompatible? Uh, and if not, is there any move towards that? Again, maybe for more for these sort of in vivo applications. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most of the body, the, the tissue contacting uh, devices, the, the tissue contacting material in almost all of these cases is, is PDMS, which, uh, which is a silicone, which is reasonably biocompatible. But I think there's certainly opportunities and there's a lot of really great groups right now thinking about surface modifications to inhibit a fibrotic response over, over long term and so on that I think are absolutely applicable here. And that's a really interesting direction. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so that was a fantastic talk and some uh, fantastic answering the questions. We've actually got more coming in now. So maybe you can have a look at the chat and answer them if, if you're interested.